So, back on topic. Galileo Galaxy devices with spelling error. Apologies about that. We're going to look at those. We're going to look at the signal flow in our Galileo Galaxy devices. Um, we're going to look at the matrices. Uh, well, it's it's one matrix, but um, it has it, it allows you to set gain and delays. We're about to discover how to assign inputs to those matrices. Uh, what kind of matrix modes there are, how to set cross points, how to manage, store and recall matrices, how to use the modifier keys, and then we're going to look at several examples of both summing matrix and finally the delay matrix, which is uh, a new feature that came with the Galileo, Galileo uh, Galaxy devices. Okay, so let's uh, look at those Galileo Galaxy devices first. Um, this is the device that we use for loudspeaker management system and uh, digital signal pr uh, processing. In the past, this used to be Galisto, and then there was the original uh, uh, Galileo, but this is the third generation of uh, Galileo. And uh, we use it primarily for calibrating and voicing uh, sound systems. It is AVB based and Milan certified, and we're going to do an entire focus week on AVB and Milan in the foreseeable future. Uh, it features proprietary processing techniques such as uh, huge shaping, product integration, which we did a webinar on, as well as LMBC. Um, it allows you to manage uh, with help of uh, the Compass control software. We can manage uh, snapshots both locally on each in device individually as well as uh, globally. It has a, a matrix which is 32 inputs and 16 outputs, which is the focus of today's webinar. Uh, it supports Space Map Go. Uh, more about that in the foreseeable future. That's our new solution for immersive sound and spatial mixing and uh, allows to talk to multiple clients at once, which is your control software, your Compass control software, uh, Compass Go and uh, Space Map Go. Uh, the Galaxy devices come in three flavors, which is the 408, the 816AS3 and the 816, which is basically a difference in I.O. capability and in input and output capability primarily. Here you see both front and rear panels of the 816, the 816 AES and the Galaxy 408 and you can see that it's primarily a difference in the number of input and output connectors. To be able to appreciate that a little bit better uh, let's look at this slide. The Galaxy um, 408 is called as such because it has four physical inputs within the pink bounding box and two of those double as AS stereo pair inputs, uh, AS3 format to be more specific. So we have four analog inputs as well as uh, two dual channel AS3 inputs, which are the ones that are in the yellow bounding box. It has eight physical outputs, all analog numbered 1 through 8 and that's the reason why it's called 408. Then it has two RJ45 Ethercon connectors which are for your AVB signals. So what does uh, what sets the 816 apart from the 408? Uh, well it has twice the amount of inputs as well as twice the amount of physical outputs which means it has eight analog inputs and four dual channel AES3 pairs and it has 16 analog outputs. Other than that um, it is um, it is functionally the same. However, the AES-3, in addition to all the features that come with the 816, has digital outputs as well, which are the physical connectors 1 through 8 on the rear panel within the orange bounding box. The trade-off is that I only have 8 rather than 16 analog outputs, but in exchange for that I have 16 dual channel AES outputs. Not to mention that the AES uh, three version has a word clock for timing critical uh, applications. That being said, every Galaxy device has a total uh, number of inputs that equals 32. Regardless whether you buy a 408 or whether you get an 816 or whether you get an 816 AS3, it will have 32 inputs in total. Uh, the minority of those inputs will be the physical inputs living on the back of the device and the majority of those inputs will be uh, the AVB stream inputs. And as far as outputs are concerned, um, the 408 obviously has eight analog outputs, physical outputs. That being said, you can completely use 16 outputs in the matrix, but um, some of those will be AVB. 
So there you have, in a nutshell, you have the base differences between these three models. Now let's look at the signal flow in such a Galaxy device. We've already done this uh, during previous webinars, and that means that I would like to specifically look at the signal flow around the center of this uh, diagram, which is the summing matrix, which is today's uh, topic. So there we go. Uh, this is an example for a uh, AES3 unit, so we have eight XLR physical inputs, which could be either AES3 or analog, and then of course we have our AVB streams. Um, we need to select those inputs and assign them to, um, we need to select any of those physical inputs and assign them to our eight input channels, which are labeled A through H, H, A through H, and those eight input channels can be processed as we're about to discover and those signals are then fed which are the first eight matrix inputs they are then fed to the summing delay matrix that being said for every galaxy small or large 408 or 816 you have an additional 24 matrix inputs which are AVB only and not processed hence the 32 inputs versus 16 outputs those 16 outputs can be processed individually and they are then ultimately fed to the physical connectors on the rear panel of the Galaxy, Galaxy device or can be sent to an AVB stream. So there you have your 32 by 16 matrix. So how do matrices uh, work in Compass? How do we operate, that's to say, these matrices in Compass? Um, it goes as followed. Here on the left side, you see that one big massive matrix. It is a matrix that consists of rows top to bottom and it consists of columns uh, left to right. To be specific there are 32 input rows if you will and 16 output columns which means that we can set 512 cross points in theory as we're about to discover. 512 cross points. However when we go to the Compass software, you will see that the control software only shows eight input rows at a time. So the uh, matrix that I stitched together on the left side is something that you will never see in total. In the Compass control software, you will only see eight input rows, matrix input rows at a time, for which there is a drop-down menu, as we're about to discover. So here you see how I use the drop-down menu to stitch all these eight input rows, groups of eight input rows, together. And that means that uh, the first group of eight rows are the physical inputs on the back of your Galaxy device, which can either be analog AES or AVB, whereas matrix inputs 9 through 32 are AVB only, and together that makes for a 32 by 16 matrix. Uh, the outputs 1 through 16 are all processed, uh, but whether you have 16 physical outputs, of course, is a function of the model of Galaxy device that you have, because a 408 has only, um, 408 only has 8 physical outputs, whereas the 416 has uh, 16 physical outputs, and not all of them have AES outputs as well. Okay. So that is the matrix. Now, how do we link inputs to outputs? Well, that goes as followed. Whenever a input row intersects an output column where they meet each other in the matrix, we refer to that as a cross point. So right now, input F meets output 6, and that means that whatever signal comes in through F goes out Apologies, wrong, uh, wrong key. Whatever comes through input F goes out through output uh, seven, uh, 6. So I've drawn two arrows to illustrate the signal flow. So the audio coming into F goes out through output 6 when we set a cross point where the input column and the input row, in the output column input row F and output column 6 meet each other. We refer to that as a cross point. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about assigning inputs because the matrix uh, <laughs> needs input assignment. For that in Compass we have to go to the settings top and assign our input in the input and output top. So that's the first thing that I propose that we look at 
within um, Compass. So I'm going to quit the keynote temporary and I'm going to change to the Compass control software. Today I'm using a virtual galaxy, but that doesn't uh, uh, rob me of any, uh, any uh, opportunity to demonstrate everything that we are going to discuss today. So I go to settings and in settings I go to the input output top and again like in the um, summing matrix and delay matrix windows as we're about to discover I only see eight input rows at once. So by default we see inputs A through H and currently no physical connector on the rear panel of the Galaxy device is connected to any of those input channels. That being said, if I click on the drop down menu, then for every input channel there is a physical connector on the rear panel that I can assign to that input channel. Uh, it could be an analog signal, it could be uh, one channel in a dual channel AES pair, or it could be AVB, which is not uh, connected today because AVB will be discovered, uh, will be covered in its own webinar. So let's say that we're using analog inputs only, then this is the way how we assign those physical connectors to the eight input channels of our Galaxy device. This is also true for 408, except that for 408 you only have four physical inputs, but still eight input channels. Um, if I want to do this for matrix inputs 9 through 32, I need to say channel selection for any of those input matrix rows. So if I want to uh, patch my AVB streams to matrix inputs 9 through 16, I have to go to that group of eight inputs rows. And this allows me per matrix input to set the primary AVB stream as well as the secondary AVB stream to be redundant. So for each matrix input row, you can assign two inputs, one is primary, one is secondary. This is true for uh, rows 9 through 16, as well as 17 through 24, as well as 25 to 32. So this is where we assign physical connections to the matrix inputs. Okay, let's go back to the keynote. So how do we go to our summing matrix and delay matrix within, um, within Compass? Well, they, uh, Compass, as we saw in previous webinar, is a tab-based uh, graphical user interface, which means that both summing matrix and delay matrix each have their own tab uh, within the graphical user interface. So let's go back to Compass and uh, let's abandon the settings top and go to the summing matrix. Here you see the first eight input rows of the summing matrix. If I want to see any of the other input rows, because we only show eight at a time, then I need to use the drop down menu show matrix rows, which allows me to see all the input rows, all 32 input rows in batches of eight, if you will. So right now we see the physical inputs, but if we go to 9 through 16, we see those AVB matrix inputs. If we go from 70 to 24, we see those AVB inputs. And then finally, the fourth batch of eight input rows is 25 to 32. It is this vast matrix, this 32 by 16 matrix, which makes it possible in the near future to use uh, Space Map Go, which is uh, a new solution for spatial sound and immersive mixing, or immersive mixing, immersive sound and spatial mixing. Uh, because this vast, vast summing matrix and delay matrix has ample horsepower to uh, deliver Space Map Go. Okay, back to the keynote because before we start setting any of these cross points there are a couple of nuances that we need to discuss because there are two kinds of um, matrix modes if you will the first one is by default is the so-called summing mode where it's possible to assign multiple inputs to the same physical output whereas in direct routing mode I can only assign one input to one output. I cannot assign multiple inputs to the same physical output. And that is a subtle but important difference. And that's the first thing that I would like to uh, show 
in the um, summing matrix. So let's go back to compass. Notice that by default, direct routing is dis disabled, which means that we're in summing mode. And that allows me to uh, assign several input rows to the same output column. So right now, I'm sending inputs A, B, and C at equal level to the same output column, which would be output number one. Without direct routing turned on in summing mode, this is possible. I can also do this for a different output. Let's do D, E, and F. And that means that all these three inputs, D through F, will be summed, hence summing mode will be summed and sent to the same physical output, um, output column number three. That is the default setting. However, if we undo this by left clicking at those cross points where column and uh, where row and column meet, we call that a cross point. If we now choose direct routing mode, then it's no longer possible to send multiple inputs to the same physical output. So notice that if I click over here, then we're setting a cross point between input A and output one. But the moment I click on input B, now input B is the sole input that is sent to that same output and it's no longer possible to send multiple inputs and sum them together and send them to the same physical output. This functionality is no longer available in direct routing. That being said, I can send the same input to multiple outputs. That's a different story altogether. So that is the difference between those two matrix modes. It's very subtle, but um, makes a difference, which I can hope, I hope you can appreciate. The operative word being route multiple inputs or route a single input. That would be the operative word. Okay. I also want to look at the levels or the gain that we can set in each at each cross point because in the summing matrix we set our gains. Our delays live in a different top as we're about to discover. Um, in the Compass control software, we use different colors to indicate uh, different gain settings at a cross point. Um, the range goes from plus 20 at most to negative infinity or off by all means at, uh, at least. Unity gain would be zero dB, which is like the best next thing to a copper wire. So whenever a cross point is set at zero dB, it is essentially a copper wire and your input row goes out through your output uh, column. That being said, we can change the level if we desire to do so. So let's go back to the Compass Control software and notice that if I click on a cross point, in this case where input A meets output one, that by default it goes to zero. That being said, if I want, I can click on that field and change it to any value of my choosing. By default, all values are negative, which means that if I type one O as in 10 on my keyboard, it automatically becomes a negative value. Same is true when I type two O on my keyboard, the keyboard, it negatively, it, it automatically defaults to a negative value. If I want to introduce a positive value, then as a safety precaution, it is mandatory. Well, it's not mandatory, it's optional, but by default, it's mandatory to use a plus sign to indicate that you want to gain rather than attenuate. So only if I press plus 20 will I get a positive value. This is just a courtesy. This is a precaution to make sure that you do not accidentally raise the level by 20 decibels when you intended it to lower it by 20 decibels. So without the plus uh, sign, without the explicit plus signs, all values default to negative values just as a contingency. Notice that depending on the amount of gain or attenuation, the color changes and the legenda or the legend for the colors can be found in the bottom of the screen. Okay, let's go back to the keynote. So, sometimes you might have a reason in summing mode, not to be mistaken for direct mode, you might have a reason to uh, send multiple physical inputs to the same physical output. Imagine, for example, that you have front fills 
and you want to send a little bit from the left discrete channel and you want to send a little bit from the right discrete channel to that same front fill. However, depending on where that front fill might live on the edge of the stage, sometimes you might have reason to include a little bit more from the most distant loudspeaker rather than the closest loudspeaker to account for the difference in distance to either the left or the right main PA. And that means that uh, we now have to uh, add uh, amounts, quantities of left and right in such a scenario. It could also be uh, under balconies or over balconies, but at, you know, sometimes you might want to add uh, left and right together in different quantities um, while, preserving, while preserving the same sum level, the same uh, total level. Because uh, think about the money channel. The money channel is the most expensive fader channel on your console, which is typically your lead vocal or your lead instrumentalist. And even if you want to mix left and right together in certain quantities, then your money channel, nine out of 10 times, is always panned through the center. So the money channel is always living at equal loudness in both the left channel as well as the right channel. And no matter how I add left and right together, I want the sum of the money channel. Very often it is desired that the sum of the money channel living in left and right together remains at the same level. Which means that uh, everybody hopefully knows that if I take one part from the left channel and one part from the right channel, two equal parts, that minus six and minus six for correlated signals becomes zero. And since your money channel, which is panned through the center, goes in equal quantity to left and equal quantity to right, or the other way around for you, left and right, um, it's a correlated signal that has equal dominance or equal presence in both left and right uh, channels. So when you add them together, those, uh, those money channels will gain six decibels. However, it might be that you have a reason that for a particular front fill or under balcony, you want to send less of the less left channel because your house left and more um, from the right channel because it's more distant and still preserve the overall level of all those money channels that are panned through the center in which case you need a different ratio a different quantity from left and a different quantity from right so this table shows you uh, every possible combination of two different amounts left and right that still add up together to zero to be the sum of all these inputs in their respective output columns, the sum will be zero decibels at all times. So this is something that is very convenient whenever you consider sending more than one input to the same physical output. And these are the kind of quantities that you should be looking for. That being said, even though in theory we have as much as 512 cross points in a 32 by 16 matrix, Due to the available horsepower, we can only set 232 cross points at most, which is still a phenomenal uh, amount of cross points. And to keep score, to keep track of how many cross points you have used in the summing matrix and in the delay matrix, there is a bar at the bottom of the screen which shows you how many cross points you have used out of the total amount of 232 cross points that are available, which is true for an 408 as well as for an 816. So let's go to the Compass control software and see, uh, see whether this is true. So the bar that we discussed earlier to go, that bar lives over here in this portion of the screen that I'm trying to annotate uh, on, top of the, um, on top of the video that you and I are seeing. That shows you the number of cross points currently used. And every time that I set a cross point, notice that that bar starts to fill up. By the time that I've set all these cross points, which are currently unity gain, it tells us that out of the 232 available cross points, we have used eight. And that leaves us uh, with 224 cross points to go. So it's a huge amount but we do not get to set 512 cross points altogether. 
Okay, so there you can keep track of how many cross points are left over. Now, um, we can make life easy. Um, while we're here, why don't I tell you a little bit about the modifier keys that we can use. I'm currently on an Apple computer, which means that if I press Shift and Command and now left click on any of the input rows, that we can assign 16 cross points at once. So Shift and Command, okay, allows me to assign 16 cross points at once. When I am not in direct routing mode, okay, I can set as many cross points for reasons that we discussed before. Using Shift and Command, okay, I can set an entire input row to all those output at once. At this point, I have also used 128 out of the 232 available cross points. <clears throat> okay, let me undo that by using the same modifier keys, Shift and Command. As we saw in the introduction to Compass webinar, we can use also modifier keys to uh, assign stereo pairs, for which I press Shift and Option on a Mac, and Shift Option allows me to assign stereo pairs at once, rather than having to do every cross point individually. So for that we use Shift and uh, Option. If you want to know more about this, I encourage you to watch the introduction to Compass webinar, webinar but this is very convenient. Uh, minor detail, you can only set stereo pairs to channels that begin with a odd number. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Then I can set stereo pairs. You cannot set stereo pairs by starting at an even number such as 2. If I click 2, it still does 1 and 2. If I click 4, it still does 3 and 4. If I click 6, it still does 5 and 6. <clears throat> okay, so there you have your modifier keys. Let's go back to the keynote. Okay, in Compass, we can not only set the gain at every cross point, but as of Galaxy, we can also set the delay at every cross point. However, once we go to the delay matrix, there are several things that we can enter. Of course, we can introduce a delay value at every cross point, and the range is 0 milliseconds, which is no delay altogether, to as much as 500 milliseconds, which is 172 meters. So that is a lot of delay. I can change the unit from milliseconds to feet or any other uh, unit of my choosing, and I can bypass the delay that is set at a cross point. In the delay matrix, however, we can still see what our gain is at any of those cross points because the color coding that we already discussed during uh, the summing matrix, the color coding is preserved. So the color coding still tells me whether I am unity gain, the copper wire, which would be the color green that I'm looking for, or shades of olive. Uh, which tell me that I have uh, positive gain values or when we have shades of gray that we're dealing with uh, negative uh, gain values. So let's abandon the uh, summing matrix and let's go to the delay matrix. Imagine for a second that we have reason to assign input row A to output column 1. Okay, well that's done over here in the summing matrix. If we now go to the delay matrix you will see the same color green telling me that according to the legend at the bottom of the screen of the graphical user interface that the legend is um, is 0 uh, dB. Okay, so in the top left corner we now have, as I saw, showed you in the keynote, we have the option to change the units from milliseconds to feet, meters or frames or samples. Um, I have uh, you know, for me, it typically lives at milliseconds by default. I can bypass any delay that we've introduced, that's to say any value, and at each cross point, I can actually set a delay. So I could make this as much as 500 milliseconds, which would be roughly about 172 meters when I change uh, the units. And I can do this for each cross point individually, and it's this 
it's this functionality which makes a uh, space map go possible in the foreseeable future. So by the end of today's presentations, we will see some uh, examples of how you can use the delay matrix, which allows you to set the delay time at each cross point, whereas the summing matrix allows you to set the gain at each uh, cross point. Okay, <clears throat> so um, all of this can of course be uh, stored and recalled in snapshots, but also uh, as individual files. And for that, I recommend using a right click and right click depending whether we are in the overview tab or in the matrix tab, um, right click um, will bring up a dialog that allows you to uh, store, recall, copy, paste matrices uh, for uh, extra functionality. So let's go to the overview top first. Imagine that we've built a certain matrix, okay? Um, uh, I've been just informed that there's no need to press shift option, shift suffices. So just by pressing the shift key, I can set the matrix in stereo pairs if I have a reason to do so. Imagine that this is the matrix that we want to store. Then there are several ways how we can do that. Uh, in the overview tab, we see the same matrix in the top right corner of our overview. If I press right click anywhere within this part of the graphical user interface, a dialog opens up and says, uh, would you like to copy the summing matrix? In which case I can paste it in a different Galaxy device. So let's give that a try. I'm gonna click copy summing matrix. I go to my inventory. I'm gonna add another processor. Let's do an 816 and let's call this my second Galaxy. Okay, that's a typo. Apologies about that. Use virtual. Okay, let me fix that. Let me fix that. Okay, this. So there we go, that's my second galaxy. And um, notice that if we go to the second galaxy that this is the default matrix, but if I right click, I can now paste the summing matrix that we copied from the other galaxy device. So that's very convenient if you work with uh, multiple galaxy devices. That being said, be sure to watch Oscar Barrientos webinar on linking, global linking, because there are more convenient ways um, how you can uh, manipulate matrices. So that's one option of using copy and paste. Of course, I can also save a matrix as a standalone file, which I can then load uh, uh, on a different device, even a real device. At any time, if I have reason to reset the matrix, then it speaks for itself. Just press reset. Are you sure you want to reset the values? And the answer is yes. And that makes the matrix empty once more. So that is the, um, that is the right mouse click um, within the overview top. However, we also have the same right click functionality within the matrix tops themselves. And uh, that allows us not only, to, um, not only to save an entire matrix, but now we also have the option to uh, save single input rows and even save individual cross points. And for the, um, for the um, jargon, for the, how things have been uh, named for the labeling, um, what you see over here, A1 tells me that this is the cross point that lives where input letter A, which is the first input row of my matrix, meets output column one, hence the coordinates, if you will, in our matrix A1, which tells me that that is the cross point uh, living at A1. And I can save and load individual cross points um, as well as rows, as well as entire matrices. So let's go to the Compass Control software and let's look at this. If I uh, set a cross point over here, Unity Gain, and I right click on this um, same cross point, I have the option to, uh, for example, copy that cross point A1. So let's copy that. And if I now right click, on this cross point, which is B2, I can say uh, paste, and then what we had at A1 is now uh, pasted 
at B2. Needless to say that if we copy uh, B2, it speaks for itself, and I go to input H, where it meets output column 8, I can paste over here, and uh, that same, that same um, value is now pasted to H8. Um, of course, we can also set an entire row, and I can also copy that row if I desire to do so. Right mouse click, but this time I want to copy matrix input row A. And now if I want to paste for whatever reason those gain settings into row C, I right click in row C and I say paste and then all those values will be, the entire row will be uh, pasted into input row C. Very uh, convenient. And of course there is the option to uh, copy or save the entire summing matrix and paste it as we saw before. So that is where you can manage uh, that is where you can manage your your matrices uh, store and recall them. All of that can also be captured in snapshots. If you want to know more about snapshots, I defer you to the um, to the introduction to Compass uh, webinar. Okay. So um, that concludes the uh, basic explanation of matrices, which means that I would like to follow up uh, with some examples of how to set up these matrices, um, which means that we're going to look at an example of a mono system, left right system, left center right system, a multi channel system such as in cinema, a musical theater, and a matrix system such as aux fed subwoofers or vocals only in the uh, front fills. Okay, now what, what does a channel constitute? What is a single channel? A channel uh, is a distinct audio waveform source. So if I were to connect an oscilloscope to a channel, I see a waveform that is unique for that channel, uh, which could be left or right or surrounds or a special source effect. So we're talking about unique program material. In a, a mono system, Okay, we feed the same mono mix to all loudspeakers within our system, which means that all loudspeakers, uh, main systems and subsystems, are all reproducing the same signal. They are 100% correlated. Um, from a, a console connectivity point of view, this could be the mono output of your console, it could be a sum of left and right, or it could be a designated matrix output on the console. And with mono systems, it's prudent to minimize the overlap between adjacent loudspeakers because everywhere you're in the joint custody of one or more loudspeakers, you're listening to correlated signals and you set the table for, uh, for destructive interference if you don't watch out. That means that in a mono application, I am feeding a single signal to my galaxy and that needs to go to the array. So imagine that um, we have our console, out of my console comes my mono feed, it goes to a Galaxy device, uh, judging by the mute buttons it goes to input A and is then being set to outputs 1 and 2 uh, which both go to my um, array and subwoofers. So in the Compass overview, uh, we have our single input channel uh, A, which has our mono mix, and it goes through the uh, curvilinear array and the subwoofers living underneath it. So in the matrix, uh, in the matrix, we would expect to see the following cross points: uh, same mono mix input A goes to both the array as well as to the subwoofers. Gain is set to zero, so it acts like a copper cable. That is a mono system. So, needless to say, with left-right systems, we have discrete left and right sends for all loudspeakers, and that means that part of the information is correlated, such as your money channel, whereas other parts of the information are uncorrelated, different waveforms. Um, that means that in terms of console connectivity, we use two outputs from the consoles, which could either be the left-right uh, main outputs uh, or buses, or we could use uh, the matrix outputs. And um, for stereo, it's of course mandatory that you're in the joint custody of both channels, uh, so overlap, unlike before, uh, within reason, overlap within reason is, uh, is appreciated to maximize the stereophonic effect. And that means that rather having one input in our galaxy, we now have left and right, and uh, since it's a stereo setup, we also will have left and right curvilinear arrays and subwoofers living underneath them. 
So in terms of setting up the matrix, now we have two inputs, A and B, and four outputs, which are our rays left and right and subwoofers left and right, respectively. And that means that within the matrix, you would expect to see um, uh, a result not unlike the one you see over here. Again, all at unity gain, where left goes to the array left, as well as subwoofers left, and right goes to the array right, as well as subwoofers right. Now, in LCR systems, uh, not uncommon in musical and such, uh, or cinema for that matter, now we have three discrete channels. We have left, right, and a center channel. And again, in the left, right, some of it is correlated and some of it is uncorrelated. And the center mono mix is typically speech or vocal and is, of course, uncorrelated with left and right. And that means that out of the console come uh, at least uh, three feeds, which is your conventional left, right, which could also be matrix outputs, plus a third output, which could be either the center output, if you have a dedicated um, output on your console, or another matrix output. And the console should, of course, be prepared for an LCR uh, solution, which means that when the pen pot, the potentiometer, lives in the middle, ideally that signal is only sent exclusively to the center channel. Whereas if it does not live in the middle, then it's sent, depending on where it lives, then it's sent to uh, left and right in different um, quantities. Again, in order to get the most out of it, the majority of your audience should be in the shared custody of LCR, of left, center, and right, to enjoy the effect. And that means that your center cluster or your center system uh, typically needs to be wide enough to cover the majority of your audience. It also means that we're feeding our Galaxy three discrete signals, left, right, and center. And that means that if we have uh, a situation like the one shown over here, three signals come out of our console, go to our Galaxy, and then one branch goes to the left, uh, main PA and subwoofers, same goes for the right, and a third branch um, goes to the uh, center array. So, in Compass, that would mean three inputs, and in this example, it would mean five physical outputs. And in terms of the matrix, we would have left going to left, right going to right, center going to the center, and sub-left going to left, and right going to the right subwoofer, obviously. Okay, so once we start adding more channels, Besides LCR, it becomes a multi-channel system, uh, very common in cinema. And now we're looking at uh, several discrete uh, channels uh, that each go to loudspeakers in different locations. Again, part of the information is correlated at times, and some of it might be uncorrelated. Uh, common in cinema are N.1 uh, systems, such as 5.1 and 7.1, where N, as in Nancy, stands for the number of full-range channels, which in 5.1 would be five channels and in 7.1 would be seven channels and the dot one comes from the fact that the low frequency effect channel is typically only one tenth or one out of ten octaves of the audible spectrum hence point one um, so that's why a 5.1 is five full range channels and a discrete point one LFE channel that does not occupy the entire audible band same goes for 7.1 uh, your mixing console uh, should be uh, designed for 5.1 or 7.1, and it's not uncommon to have a joystick uh, that allows you to send uh, a specific channel to any of those uh, discrete outputs. Uh, in terms of cinema, you have your screen channels, which is left, center, right. So that is uh, a common feature, but on top of that, you have your uh, surrounds, and uh, the number of surrounds uh, determines the N as in Nancy. Okay. So in a 5.1 approach, that would mean that we have uh, six discrete channels going into our galaxy where the low frequency uh, effect channel is, is the point 0.1 channel. The other one are full range. Uh, six going into the galaxy, six coming out of the galaxy. So here we see our, uh, our, uh, Dolby, our Dolby processor. Uh, it goes with uh, six discrete channels to our galaxy and then from the galaxy we have our three screen channels blue is the left screen channel green is the center screen channel red is the right screen channel then we have our LFE uh, which goes to the subwoofers uh, in this case left and right that's the brown tie line 
and then we have the light blue line which goes to our surrounds and we have the magenta or pink uh, tie line which goes to the other surrounds uh, all of that would be six inputs uh, six outputs in a galaxy overview uh, there we have our six discrete inputs and we have our uh, six outputs and in terms of matrixing this is uh, one way of how you would set that up where left goes to left right goes to right center goes to center lv goes to lv left surround goes to left surround right surround goes to right surround um, everything set at unity gain so basically uh, copper wire in 7.1 uh, the numbers just go up now you have your left right center lfe left surround right surround as well as your back or rear surround channels and that means that we now have eight discrete input channels and that means that uh, in the previous examples all our surrounds were connected to the same galaxy output now we have uh, discrete outputs for the ones that are firing in your back and uh, discrete outputs for the ones that are firing in your ears and in a, a compass overview we are now using we're utilizing all eight inputs uh, to accommodate, accommodate those uh, rear surrounds and we're using uh, all eight outputs out of 16 in this case um, 408 could also do this with eight physical outputs um, and in terms of the matrix uh, this is one way of how you could set that up um, more of the same and finally let's look at matrix systems uh, matrix systems are systems where you might have uh, aux fat subwoofers or a, f uh, a reason for vocal only in uh, in the front fills which is not uh, an uncommon uh, use case and that means that uh, let's look at an uh, aux fat scenario first subs and aux uh, you'll typically get left and right plus an auxiliary feed um, and that needs to go to the subwoofers so um, this is what it would look like you have three in terms of console connectivity you have three discrete channels coming out of the console uh, going to three inputs on the galaxy uh, the aux auxiliary coming from the console goes to the subwoofers left and right whereas the uh, discrete left and right channels go to their uh, respective curvilinear rays left and right um, in the overview that would be three inputs and in this case it would be uh, four outputs uh, for each array and for each pair or trip triplet of subwoofers um, an output in terms of a setting of the matrix uh, left goes to left right goes to right and the auxiliary goes to both left and right uh, subwoofers in such an application so what changes if we also have an auxiliary feed for the front fills because somebody only wants to send a stem vocals only for example a stem to those front fills because we already have more than enough uh, acoustical electrical guitar in those first rows we don't need more of that we only need more vocal fresh and intelligible vocal in those first rays then this is not an uncommon approach it also means that out of our console now come uh, four signal feeds left and right plus two auxiliary feeds uh, this is the same scenario as before except that we now have a dedicated signal going to those front fills and on the console level we can uh, choose which input channels on the mixing console are going to those uh, loudspeakers living on the edge of the stage it also means that we have a fourth input in such a scenario which is our front fill on an auxiliary um, our front fill feed on an auxiliary that is and we have five physical outputs and that means that in the matrix uh, you would still see left going to left right going to right subwoofers going to sub left and right and a dedicated fourth input going exclusively um, to the front fills so what changes well maybe somebody wants even a dedicated control over the uh, side fills uh, so on and so forth uh, now you know things really start to grow in scale um, so we now have four inputs we have uh, left right our subwoofers which is now become a horizontal array uh, on an auxiliary we still have our front fills on a dedicated signal uh, but now we also want to send left and right to our side fill arrays not just to left and right but also to the uh, out fills um, so how would you set that up um, again for inputs this time we also have uh, out fills or side fills I prefer out fills because side fills are typically used uh, for on stage um, but in this scenario it is one and the same thing 
it implies one and the same thing we're talking about outfills um, and in your matrix you would now have left going to left right going to right a uh, in this case uh, uh, it was determined to use a sum of left and right and send it to the left outfill or side fill because the people that are looking into the ears of Mick Jagger are in the sole custody of that array that is facing their direction and the same is true for the people that are looking in his other ear they're typically in the sole custody of that array and if you want to preserve uh, some cross-pollination some information coming from both sides this would be one way of doing it where you have one part coming from left one part coming from right but before we saw that you can play with these ratios while still keeping his vocal the money channel at the same level our subwoofers are going to left and right our subwoofer feet are going to left and right subwoofers um, and the front fill is going to the front fills and then we also have delays in this example um, so a, a a sum in summing mode a sum of left and right is also going uh, to the delays in this application okay now we go to a uh, musical theater where you typically have even more inputs now you have a uh, music left music right uh, which is typically your orchestra pit um, you have your vocals front fills you might have an effect sent for subwoofers dedicated effect sense to do uh, uh, cannon shots or thunder or anything where you really need a lot of LF um, and then you might even have your surrounds uh, left right and back in musical theater uh, things tend to get pretty involved um, so at this point we're looking already at uh, eight inputs and um, let's see how such a, 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 a setup um, could um, work in practice we have our console we have eight um, discrete signals coming out of the console going to our galaxy that uh, feeds our subwoofers uh, it feeds uh, the front fills underneath it that are facing us uh, they are facing the rear surrounds uh, they are uh, the, the orange tie line are the rear surrounds uh, the pink tie line are your left surrounds the green tie line are your right surrounds and I for in order for you to make sense this is green and this should be pink if I'm not mistaken um, and then um, we have our left array we have a right array uh, we might have uh, side fills again in this case it would be likely infills which are the point sources that we see over there and in terms of uh, patching this in the matrix we now have as much as eight inputs to as much as 12 outputs uh, all these loudspeakers with different job descriptions and that means in the matrix uh, it could look uh, like this where music left is going to the left array it's going to the right array uh, the music is also being sent but summed together it's a monosum it's being sent to the delay loudspeakers as well um, we might have our vocals which only go to the vocal array as well as to the side fills that are living on the deck to support the center cluster while pulling down the image so that vocal signal is also going to those infills um, then we have a separate feed for the front fills our effect subs or our, our, our uh, aux fat subwoofer signal goes exclusively to the subwoofers and we might have three uh, discrete surround channels that respectively go to surrounds left surrounds right and surrounds in the back <clears throat> um, so you very very versatile very flexible um, and uh, still with ample cross points left over um, so these are all examples where we set uh, the gain at the cross points we haven't yet set any delay at the cross points um, what could be the use case um, for setting delays at any of the cross points um, well let's look at that um, let's look at this slide <coughs> uh, where we see a plan view uh, the stage is at the bottom the audience is in the top we're looking at the venue from above um, we have a discrete center channel and this uh, uh, um, center channel requires um, could be uh, under balconies could be the lay loudspeakers uh, requires help requires reinforcement in the last portion of the room um, now I might want to send a copy of that uh, center signal to those delay loudspeakers to lift the uh, level that we lost over distance but I also know that uh, the time that it takes for the sound to cross the distance between where the center cluster lives 
and the middle delay loudspeaker lives, that that distance is shorter and therefore takes less time to cross that distance at the speed of sound. Whereas for that same signal emanating from the center cluster to cross the distance all the way to where we see that um, second from the right under balcony, that takes more time and needless to say to cross the air gap all the way to the rightmost under balcony takes even more time. With only one delay to play with, we can already tell that we cannot time align each and every one of those delay loudspeakers or under balconies, give them the optimum delay to have a summation free from artifacts at each point in their joint custody where the center cluster meets the delay loudspeaker uh, and where they see eye to eye at the same level. With one delay, there is no way that I can do that and make it work for all those positions. However, if I could assign a unique delay while still using the same discrete audio channel, which is a copy of my center channel, if I could introduce a a uh, discrete delay, a unique delay to each of these loudspeakers, I might sacrifice the transition where they kiss, but within the joint custody where delay and center run at the same level, now my timing is fixed. It also requires that I have uh, a discrete output channel um, for any of these loudspeakers. That is to say, at least for the pairs, which would mean that this could be one discrete output channel and then the ones living to its left and to its right could be one output channel and then the outermost could be same output channel, uh, another output channel because it's a symmetrical situation. Uh, you could do this, you could do this in the, uh, in the delay matrix. Um, there is another way around, but I want to show you uh, why this uh, might be convenient. So uh, for all I know, this is my uh, center signal, okay? Let's name that center signal. And for all I know, I have uh, these under balconies, which might be the uh, right, right, right. And then we might have right, right. And then we might have the one in the center, left, left. And then we might have left, left, left. Five, um, five under balconies. If I now go to my summing matrix, I see my center input row and I see each of those uh, five each of those five discrete output channels. Um, I can set the gain at any of those cross points and unity gain makes it a, a copper wire. And now using the delay matrix, I can also assign a unique delay at each cross point where my center signal meets one of these five outputs. And for all I know, it only takes uh, uh, 30 milliseconds to cross the air cap between the center cluster and the center on the balcony. It might take 36 to meet the guy next to it, and it might take 42 to meet the guy next to that. And of course, uh, I would do the same for the other guys. This would be one way of doing it. And maybe you think, why do you do it over here? Why don't you simply do it on the individual outputs themselves? Because I can also say, you know what, let's do 32, and then we do, uh, then we do uh, 36, and then we do 30, and then we do 36, and we do, do 42. Sure, that would have functionally the same effect. What I like about the other approach is that if we zero this out and do it um, and do it in the delay matrix, that we have an extra layer of freedom, and that extra layer of freedom allows us to uh, increase the overall delay to all those outputs uh, together while maintaining the relative, uh, the relative time offset. And there is a function built into Compass which preserves exactly that. This is just an extra uh, layer of freedom. Because for all I know, you might now have a visiting act that for whatever reason wants the delay loudspeakers to be delayed more. Well, since all the delay settings live within the delay matrix, I can now select all these five under balconies at once. And if somebody wants two milliseconds more for whatever reasons, we're going to add the two milliseconds. And this preserves my absolute alignment, which I've now relocated to the delay matrix. Um, 
there is no preferred method this is just uh, one way of doing it because tomorrow comes the next act or a, a different band and then you zero this out and everything is back at zero while still preserving the relative alignment or the absolute alignment I should say but it's been relocated to the delay matrix so that is um, it's just one of many ways to deal um, with such an application um, same could be true for this scenario okay imagine that uh, you want your front fills uh, to meet house left um, again we have the option to use one delay time for all front fills in which case uh, they're not gonna meet each other due to the triangulation of it they're not gonna meet each other and be in time for every position that is to say everyone living in front of those front fills is not gonna hear uh, house left and the front fill simultaneously with only one delay time for the entire front fill system also over here you have the option to use uh, either the delays in the outputs themselves by setting those delays uh, by setting those delays um, by setting those delays in the uh, in the outputs so let me uh, zero this out okay let me zero this out again you have the option to uh, do it in the outputs themselves with the same um, the same rules of engagement as we discussed before in which case this would be five front fills and you could give them each a unique delay time or you could do it in the uh, delay matrix and this would now be your uh, front fill rather than your center this would now be your uh, front fill uh, feed or a sum of left and right so again more of the same um, same is true in a uh, cinema application if you have a reason to time align all those surrounds to the PLP or preferred listening position with respect to the center screen channel you could do it in the delay matrix you could do it in the outputs themselves but um, it really becomes interesting and 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 there's no uh, way around it that I'm aware of it really becomes interesting when the same delays loudspeakers or front fills but when the same loudspeakers have dual duty that is to say the under balconies or over balconies or delay loudspeakers need to restore the level loss of a center cluster as well as restore the level loss of uh, house left or house right now you hopefully start to appreciate that um, that I need separate delay times for each of these two discrete um, inputs because if we go to the center delay loudspeaker then my center cluster that is physically closer will be leading with respect to house left that is physically more distance and if this was the only delay loudspeaker that I needed to be concerned with I could make this work but if we go to the outer delay loudspeaker it's the other way around at the outer delay loudspeaker house left is leading because it's physically closer whereas the center cluster is now lagging because it's physically more distant and whatever delay time I end up using for the outer under balcony will not work for the center one and uh, same goes for the one that is living next to it so now having a delay matrix really becomes uh, an interesting solution to still have each loudspeaker meet its companion while being time aligned uh, while being time aligned even though we have multiple discrete channels however when you do this it is of course mission critical that take for example your lead vocal that you do not send your lead vocal to both the center cluster as well as house left because a copy of those signals center cluster and house left will now be summed together in the matrix and sent to any of those under balconies but since there is a different geometrical relationship the delay times will be different and now you're generating a comb filter within the summing matrix because you have two copies of the same vocal channel being summed together in the summing matrix 
with a time offset because you're using individual time offsets for any of these discrete input channels on their way to the under balcony loudspeakers. That's why I made this little joke, keep calm and don't cross the streams. Whenever you do this, which can be very powerful, you don't want to send multiple copies of the same signal to uh, multiple, uh, uh, multiple of these loudspeakers because now you set the table for comb filtering in the summing matrix in the electronic domain which is the most uh, relentless kind of comb filter that you can think of that being said very powerful uh, solutions are now at your disposal and that brings us uh, to the end of um, of this webinar on matrixing um, before we do Q&A um, tomorrow my Spanish colleague um, my Mexican colleague Spanish-speaking Mexican colleague uh, Mauricio Ramirez will do uh, the same presentation once more in Spanish and uh, and he has some extras uh, that uh, are surely worth um, watching so um, even if you don't speak Spanish I encourage you uh, to watch his uh, version as well and um, I'm very much looking forward because this is the week of Cine Studio, which means that we're going to talk about cinema and post-production and studio in which matrixing uh, plays a big part. Um, and that means that um, Wednesday we will have a case study on Cine Studio, but even uh, more excited is that Friday, uh, none other than our CEO, John Meyer, um, will make a guest appearance on Friday's webinar. It's going to be Zoom only. And John is going to take us on a journey from A to B, as in from Apocalypse Now to Blue Horn System. He's going to take us uh, on a journey through history and explain us in the Cine Studio, uh, uh, in the Cine Studio setting, how uh, the birth of Cine Studio Meyer Sound with the 650 subwoofer for Apocalypse Now ultimately evolved into uh, today's uh, Blue Horn System. Very much looking forward to this. It's absolute. Uh, the highlight of this uh, uh, series of webinars so far. So be sure to dial in uh, on Friday through Zoom. Okay, a recording of today's webinar will be uploaded to Thinking Sound to our YouTube channel. And that means that we've officially come to the end of uh, today's webinar. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, I'm going to uh, look at the chat and see whether you might have uh, uh, questions uh, regarding uh, matrixing the topic of uh, today's uh, webinar. Okay, well, it appears that there are no questions, in which case, uh, thank you very much for uh, watching another Myersound webinar and hope to see you uh, during the course of this week, particularly on Friday. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Bye bye.